Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Kimberlea, if you've never met me before. If you have been here before, thanks so much for coming back. Sometimes I laugh in my videos, sometimes I make jokes, sometimes I try to be lighthearted. It can come off as rude and I mean no disrespect to any of the victims in any of these stories. But this one, this one makes me feel really gross and it, it really hits home for me. I live in Los Angeles and this story is just too real. Like it could happen to anyone. This killer has actually been known by many names. The Chiller Killer, the Boy Next Door Killer, and the Hollywood Ripper. And that is the one that stuck. Michael Garjula was born on February 15th, 1976 in Glenview, Illinois. Him and his parents and his brothers seemed like the typical middle-class family. He attended a school called Glenbrook South High School, where his grades and baseball playing career remained much more unremarkable than his short temper. Yes, he had a short temper. The fact that they always say they were the typical family, were they though? But yes, he had a short temper, he always seemed angry, and he took that anger out on others by bullying them. He was distant and antisocial from a younger age, and he really never fit in. He was somewhat of a loner. He had a classmate, her name was Trisha Picaccio, and she was the opposite. She was a bubbly, well-liked 18-year-old, and she was actually part of the school debate team. She had just gotten a scholarship to Purdue, so she had a lot going for her in her life. Trisha knew Michael because her younger brother was friends with him and Michael had been in their home several times. They lived just a block away from each other which is going to come into play. One of the reasons he's called the boy next door killer but we'll get to that later. So it could be that Trisha wasn't that surprised when she saw Michael outside of her home in the middle of the night. This was on August 14th 1993 after she was coming home from a school pep rally. The next morning, her own father made the gruesome discovery of his daughter's body. He was stepping outside to walk his dog. Can you imagine? It's bad enough that something like this happens, but to stumble upon the remains of your child, a knife was used and it was used at least a dozen times, all over, body and face. Trisha had wounds that punctured her lung and her heart, her stomach, and in her back. Another thing was that her left arm was twisted so much that it actually broke. And there had not been a single scream during the night. Nobody heard anything that night, nobody. However, when her father, Rick Picaccio, stumbled upon her remains, he shrieked and that scared his wife. Of course, they were devastated and they were taken to a hospital because they were in such shock about what happened. Something like this did not happen in their quiet community. Another thing that a lot of true crime cases say, but no one knew who could have done something like this. It was just too horrible. It was a close-knit community. They just couldn't understand what happened. There really didn't seem to be a motive and there was no SA. There was no robbery, didn't seem like there was any vendetta. Why would there be? It just seemed to be a senseless murder of a young, beautiful girl. Everybody was questioned. Everybody possible, including Michael. But of course, he denied any involvement in this brutal crime. There was DNA evidence found underneath Trisha's fingernails, but of course, it couldn't be explored at the time. And then her murder became a cold case. Five years later, Michael was 22 years old and he decided to move to Los Angeles. This was five years after Trisha's death. He actually came here with hopes of being an actor and he worked as a repairman, a bouncer, and he ended up landing a role in some kind of show or movie as a boxer. Despite being kind of complicated and weird with a short temper, Michael actually did have a good amount of girlfriends. He definitely had a lot of casual partners and he even had some secret lovers. Not to make him sound too interesting, but he did date a girl named Allison. They lived together in Los Angeles and they settled into Orchid Avenue behind the famous Chinese theater in Hollywood. 
This is actually not far from where Michael's next victim resided. Her name was Ashley Ellerin. She was 22 years old. Again, the boy next door killer. This is why. I like to tell a little bit about these victims. I feel like it honors their memory. And so with that being said, Ashley was a student. She was a fashion student at LA's Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising. And then she was also a part-time dancer when she actually met the famous actor Ashton Kutcher. Her friends described her as a small town girl from Northern California. She was beautiful, fun, and spontaneous. But Ashton and Ashley were introduced, oh, that's a nice little combination of names, but they were introduced in December of 2000 and they met through friends and had gone out a couple times on some dates. A few weeks before she died, the two of them had reconnected. They bumped into each other at a housewarming party and they made plans to go out again. It was February 21st, 2001, and Ashley was getting ready for her date that night with Ashton. But back then, he wasn't who he is now or who he had been. He was not the famous actor. He was pretty unknown back then, but still, later on, he ends up testifying because, of course, something bad happened. On the night of their date, he called two times. He was letting Ashley know that he was actually gonna be late. The second phone call ended around 8.45 p.m. and unbeknownst to him, just a few moments later, Ashley would die. Later that night, Ashton arrived at her house and he was wondering why she hadn't answered his previous calls. He thought maybe she was upset that he was late and he didn't know what else to think, so he knocked on her door, but nobody answered. He tried the door, but it was locked and the lights were on. So we decided to take a look inside of one of the windows. And here's what's interesting. And I don't know about you. I don't think I would have assumed this. He looked inside the window and he thought he saw what looked like red wine on the floor on her carpet. But I wouldn't assume that. If I saw something red on someone's carpet, they weren't answering the phone. They're a woman. They're beautiful in Hollywood. I don't know. Like I would investigate that a little further, but he said he thought nothing of it. And again, he just thought she was mad at him and she had left to do her own thing that night. And they were actually going to a Grammys after party that night. So it was kind of a big deal. And it was 1045 when he knocked on her door, just to give you the timeline. But then again, why would you miss out on the opportunity to go to a Grammys after party? So to assume that she just left with the red stain and her not answering, I just still think it's a little bit odd, but I forgot that I read that she had thrown a party the night before. So him thinking that the red wine was just spilled might not have been that odd. Just remember that. But of course, Ashton leaves and the next morning, the police actually found Ashley's body. Again, this was brutal. This time it was 50 times. And you know what I'm talking about, Jody Arias, okay? 50 times, 50. And that usually happens when you know a person. It usually is very personal. It's up close. You're in a position where you could actually feel their blood. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that many times, she was actually pronounced dead at 9.28 in the morning. And to just think that Ashton was there, could he have stopped it? I don't know. What if she would have still been alive? I don't think so though, because her injuries included a neck wound. It wasn't one that you could have survived because it nearly, you know, okay? And she definitely had deep enough wounds to her chest, her stomach, and her back, which is very similar to what we found in Trisha's case as well. Some of them were actually six inches deep. Oh my gosh, okay, one of them actually was so bad that it looked like a puzzle piece had come out of her skull. Ashley had actually known Michael. She met him the previous October because he had offered to help fix a flat tire that Ashley's friend was dealing with on her car. And of course, Ashley was very beautiful, so he paid her a lot of attention and he was super friendly. There was nothing weird about his presence in that moment. And that was according to the friend that had been there and had her tire fixed. Michael had introduced himself as a local repairman because he did have an odd job as a repairman and he gave the girls his card. 
And then Michael and Ashley kind of became friends and he was a regular visitor over at Ashley's and her roommate's home. They did know each other and Ashley's friends would later say they always thought Michael was kind of weird and he had sort of what they described as an obsessive character about him. And he would sometimes be seen staring at Ashley from his pickup truck in the early hours of the morning. That's weird. And then oddly, if that wasn't weird enough, Michael told Ashley's roommate that he had been linked to a murder near Chicago. Why would you tell someone that? It's like, is that a bragging thing? Are you expecting her to be afraid of you? What do you want? He also mentioned that if the FBI would ever show up, it was because they wanted his DNA. He would actually tell a similar story to one of his secret lovers, Velma. Velma had later testified that Michael told her that he left Illinois because of a murder he did not commit, but the police were trying to pin it on him because they had his DNA. The authorities actually questioned a lot of people and ruled out several suspects in Ashley's case before they were left with Michael. And because he was known to visit Ashley's house, even uninvited, they wanted to question him, but he turned out to be really challenging to track down. But in 2002, detectives from Illinois came to Los Angeles to finally get a DNA sample from Michael with the aim of finding Trisha's killer. What stood out were the similarities of the two cases. They were astonishingly similar to authorities. Why did I use that word? And even though they happened over a decade apart and so far from each other, I mean, they happened on the opposite sides of the country, but still police were trying to connect the two. Detectives finally tracked down Michael, who was now living in his West LA home with his new girlfriend, Grace. The blood sample was taken from Michael and the police were sure that they were about to close these cases. But after 10 long months, in September 2003, the results came in and Michael's DNA matched perfectly with the DNA found under Trisha's fingernails. And you would think, with all of this information and evidence that Michael's murderous rampage was over, but it wasn't. There's more. For reasons that nobody can understand, the Cook County prosecutors declined to file charges against Michael. This decision would cost another woman's life, Maria Bruno. In September of 2005, Michael had moved again to the second floor of an apartment on Arden Way in El Monte, East Los Angeles. He moved with his now pregnant girlfriend, Grace. Soon, the 32-year-old Maria Bruno moved in to a unit on the first floor of the same gated apartment complex. Maria was so beautiful. All of these women were so beautiful. She was a single mom of four children. She had just taken a position as a clerk at a furniture store and she was actually going through a fresh divorce and she was trying to do her best to start a new life. Maria's life was cut short when on December 1st, 2005, Maria was found dead in her apartment. She was also killed the same way and this was 17 times in her throat and her chest was messed with in a way that just shouldn't be. <sighs> and thank God her body was not found by her children but instead it was found by her estranged husband, which doesn't make it any better, but thankfully her children were spared from being traumatized by seeing that. He told the 911 dispatcher that he found her in a pool of blood and that her breast had been, one of her, you know, was actually put over her mouth. Why would you do that? You're a sick <laughs> He was sick completely deranged. A Los Angeles County Sheriff's Detective, Mark Lowenfeld, had actually said that Maria was a mother, she was a wife, she was a daughter, and she was a sister. He was the one that investigated Maria's death. And he just said she was all of those things to all of those people. I just don't understand why someone who does this doesn't think about that. Don't they care? 
What if they? What if this happened to them or someone that they knew or their own mother? Maria had actually moved from El Salvador to the United States when she was younger, and she met her husband soon after that. The two got married, and she later gave birth to four children. She left behind two-year-old twins, a four-year-old, and a five-year-old. Neighbors were questioned, but again, nobody really fell under suspicion, and the police tried to knock on Michael's door several times, but no one answered. His girlfriend had moved back into her parents' house to get away from Michael because he'd end up becoming abusive. But she actually saw a police flyer later and it detailed the murder. And she was shocked to see the familiar address. Instead of calling the police, Grace ends up calling Michael. And she was just shocked because she knew this victim. She even helped her bring her groceries inside. That's just way too close to home. Maria's murder remained unsolved and years passed by. By 2008, Michael had married and he was living with his new wife in Santa Monica. He was living close by to his next victim. He was actually living on the same street. His next victim's name was Michelle Murphy. She was a bubbly 26 year old and on April 28th, she had a really busy day. She was doing housework, she was exercising, she was jump roping and sprinting, and then after dinner, she was watching TV, and then she headed to bed. Michael uh, was in her bedroom, and she woke up to find him repeatedly, you know what, multiple times. She was screaming, she was fighting back, she was muscular, um, she was you know, in really good shape and she ended up kicking Michael as hard as she could. I mean, she was determined to get away from him. She got several stab wounds to her hands, her arms, her chest, but she still managed to get away. She had grabbed the knife so tightly that the blade cut her. Not only that, she held on to it so tightly that the blade was pushed back into Michael's hand. But she kicked again and again and again, and she was actually able to push him off of her. Then something weird happened. Michael fell off the bed, and he was like out of a trance. He, it's like something clicked in his head. He got up, and he said, I'm sorry. He apologized to her and then he escaped through her front door. She obviously ran, locked the door and called her boyfriend and 911. But now they had Michael's DNA because she was able to cause the knife to cut his hand and blood was left behind. Four weeks later, that DNA sample was matched to Michael and he was linked to the three previous murders. He had lived close by to all of these people. So all four cases kind of came together and they revealed the truth. And the truth was the incompetent police work. It was shoddy police work, shoddy investigations, because they could have stopped Michael a long time ago, years ago. But finally on June 6, 2008, Michael was arrested and charged with the attempted murder of Michelle Murphy and the murders of Ashley Ellerin and Maria Bruno. On July 7, 2011, the Cook County State's Attorney finally charged Michael with the first degree murder of Trisha Picaccio. It has been suspected that Michael may have even more victims because allegedly, for whatever reason, he told authorities in the Los Angeles County Jail that if 10 women are killed and his DNA was found uh, doesn't mean that he did it and I don't know what that's supposed to mean and he hasn't been linked to any other murders. We've seen this in other cases either they try to say they've done other things for like bragging rights once they're in prison or I, I don't even know why I can't figure it out. The media in Los Angeles gave Michael the name Hollywood Ripper and the chiller killer but like I said Hollywood Ripper is the one that stuck. After many delays Michael's trial began here in California on May 2nd, 2019. It just happened. And Ashton Kutcher actually testified in this trial. He testified to all the things that I had talked about, about their date, about how they met, about going to her home that night, calling her, 
her not answering when he knocked on the door. And on August 15th, 2019, Michael was convicted on all counts. And by October 18th, 2019, a jury actually recommended the death penalty after several hours of deliberation. And that's what he deserves. His hobby was plotting the perfect opportunity to attack women with a knife in and around their homes. We, the jury in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Michael Gargiulo, guilty of the crime of first degree murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A of felony, who did unlawfully and with malice of forethought murder Ashley Ellerin as charged in count six of the information. We further find the special circumstance that the defendant intentionally killed the victim by means of lying in wait within the meaning of Penal Code Section 190.2A15 to be true. We further find the allegation that the defendant personally used a de deadly and dangerous weapon to wit knife. We, the jury in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Michael Gargiulo, guilty of the crime of first degree murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A, a felony, who did unlawfully and with malice aforethought murder Maria Bruno as charged in count four of the information. We further find the special circumstance that the defendant intentionally killed the victim by means of lying in wait. Guilty of the crime of attempted murder in violation of Penal Code Section 664-187A, a felony, who did unlawfully and intentionally attempt to murder Michelle Murphy as charged in count two of the information. Sentencing for Michael in California has continued to be delayed. It's been delayed by defense motions, and it's just incredible that so much time has gone by. But he could face extradition back to Illinois so he can be charged first degree murder for Trisha's death. As of early February of this year, 2021, Michael did appear in court once again to plead with a judge to spare his life and ignore the jury's recommendation for the death penalty. We will have to wait till later this year to see what the judge eventually decides, but I think the judge should say, too bad, no, you did this, it was brutal, it was horrific, it was disgusting, and quite frankly, I always think that murderers should have the same things done to them. Whatever, it's like an eye for an eye. You do that to someone, that's what you have to have done to you. I know not everyone agrees. Some people don't agree in taking a life because it's the same thing, but life in prison to me is just too easy. My dad is a convicted felon. He went to prison for many years, and I can tell you, it's just not the same as never being able to breathe again. Leave it below. Are you for or against the death penalty and tell me why? Keep it clean, keep it kind. Well, once again, thank you so much for watching. If you like this kind of content, please don't forget to subscribe, give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, and I will see you in my next video. Bye.